as you would join me in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 43 through 48, Matthew chapter 5. Um, kind of a little bit of introduction to all of this. We, we talked about maybe about four or five weeks ago or so that we were really going to begin a series on the teachings of Jesus Christ. And, um, and we're gonna, I've been continuing that in many different forms. And um, about two weeks ago, I started a sermon called Don't Get It Twisted, if you remember that conversation, Don't Get It Twisted. And um, we had Independence Day last Sunday, and I really felt like the Holy Spirit wanted to go a whole different way last Sunday, and he did. Um, I felt last Sunday was just as much for me as it was, it was for anybody else. That was really powerful. And, um, but today I feel led to finish this sermon. And uh, so again, there's two titles today. It's coming off of the sermon, Don't Get It Twisted, out of the teachings of Jesus Christ in Matthew uh, chapter 5, uh, verses 43 to 48. But there's a specific title for today, a specific title just for today, and is this, the title is this, The Hard Part of Love. The Hard Part of Love. So let's read, the, let's read the Word of God together and we'll jump into our passage today. Matthew chapter 5, verses 34 through 43, I'm sorry, through 48. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if, you're great, if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven as, is, is perfect. Just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Um, just again, remind ourselves, tax collectors back in those days, lowest form of human beings <laughs> in that society. So when he's drawing that comparison, don't, isn't this what the tax collectors do? What he's saying is, aren't you just like the lowest denominator? They even do that. And so if they can do that, how much more should we be doing? Um, so I, I want to kind of just give a quick review before we jump into this. And so we kind of just got through the very first part of this two weeks ago. And we are talking about when Jesus says in the very first verse of 43, he said, you have once heard it was said to, to hate or to uh, hate your enemies. And it's interesting because Jesus in this moment was correcting a false teaching that was coming down from the spiritual leaders of that day. And he was saying, that's not at all what the law is saying to us. The law is really saying that you're called to love your enemies. And remember, we talked before about the problem with this was the fact that the Pharisees were, in a sense, really just saying, you know what, we're going to choose who my enemies are and who my friends are. And they were choosing that based upon their own preferences. And so again, what they were doing was putting conditional love out there. In, in, in the best way to put that, I'm going to choose whom I love, and I'm going to choose not whom I love. I'm going to choose who I should treat well and who I don't have to treat well. And they were taking the law and they were twisting it so it was more comfortable to their flesh. And how many of you know that's extremely dangerous to do? And this is why we have to be so aware, even in these days of false teachers, because false teaching, false doctrine comes out of the fact that you take a piece of truth and you twist it to take advantage of it somehow. You don't just let it speak for itself. And so Jesus was really addressing a false doctrine of that day that they had started teaching. It wasn't from him. And if you notice that Jesus uses the same language, he uses that word love, agape. He, he uses the word love in that context, and what is so beautiful about it is that in, when Jesus does this, he doesn't use a different word, he just untwisted the word that they used for their own discretion, for their own comfortability in those times. And um, there is something so important to make sure that, first of all, that we're never ever agreeing with a twisted gospel, that we're not living out a twisted gospel, but that we live out the pure, righteous teachings of Jesus Christ. We don't add to it, we don't take away from it, and we don't slant it. Does that make sense? It's easy to slant something when, because you want to make yourself feel more comfortable. I've, you know, it's easy to be able, this is where we get the terms, and forgive the expressions, but the only ones I have, this is how I think this term white lie came into effect. Well, it's just a white lie. Well, okay, wait a minute. Um, it's like saying, well, I'm just kind of pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant, right, ladies? So it's either a lie or it's not a lie. So there's no such thing as this innocent white lie. It's just a lie, and lying is wrong, right? And I'm just pregnant, and hallelujah. There's just, there's just you know what I mean? There's, just, there's no trying to find a middle road that makes us more comfortable. 
with what our flesh wants to do, and that's what Jesus is addressing. Um, and so it's, it's um, and again, have you ever had your kids <laughs> obey, the, obey the instruction you gave them, but they truly, truly went around the heart of the instructions? Do you know what I mean by that? We've all had that, haven't we? They've, they've really kind of, they've done what you've told them to do, but they did it in such a way that kind of worked around the actual order in the first place. And, and there's a danger in that because when we give instructions, it's because we want to, want to keep them safe, first of all, is why we do that. And also because of the fact that we want them to learn to honor and respect authority, which is truly, truly part of what our country is hurting from right now. There's generations and individuals and, and, um, that don't respect authority. And when we have a lack of respect for authority, we have anarchy. And we're experiencing that across our nations. And, and what's interesting is that when you begin to not respect authority, then all of a sudden there becomes no standard of truth in your society. And we are suffering from that. We are suffering from that. Now, a standard of truth means that we're all in agreement with this one truth, so therefore we're going to live according to that. Well, somebody chose one day to say, you know what, I'm not sure I agree with that. I don't want to honor authority, so I'm going to do my own thing. And all of a sudden, anarchy begins to break out. And it's interesting because um, people were talking about the generation right now that's rioting the most. I, I, I want to just give you a very sobering word, and I've kind of preached about what we do with our own generations. The generations right now that are rioting and that are really against uh, the, the authority of our world right now, I want us to understand that that is coming out of the generations of the 50s. So I, I wanted you to hear this just for a second. When, when all of a sudden, when it was more the Vietnam War, all those things that triggered off so many different things, and the rebellion against the government, and all of a sudden we went towards uh, Woodstock and, you know, Peace, Love, Dope, all those other things, there became this resistance to, to the authority of the government. And I want to be able to say that part of the fallout that we feel now is part of the rebellion of that generation. Now, you may not agree with that, but I would encourage you to do some research because it really is, there's some reality to that, where that all of a sudden they started pushing backs against the government and all of a sudden we find ourselves in a place where there's no more respect or honor for the flag. There's no more respect and honor for our, our elected officials. And, and, and Lord, forgive us because there are some that don't really deserve to be respected, but we still have to honor them in their offices, amen? We don't have to agree with them, but we still have to honor them. This is getting political, I'm not trying to do that, but I want us to open our eyes to the effect of what happens when a generation begins to twist the word of God and think for themselves? What happens when a generation begins to say, the word of God no longer applies to my life and I'll make up my own rules? That's part of what happens in our society. But that's not the heart of all that I want to say to you today. So let's get into the rest of this passage. I don't want to get too far off of this. So again, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48, and let me tell you why I think this is such a crucial passage to preach right now. Because one of the things that I'm very aware of in the middle of the COVID-19, in the middle of all the rioting, that all those things are symptoms of something greater. And I believe they're symptoms of something greater that is actually attached to this passage of Scripture. This is why we don't need to just preach it. We need to meditate on what's going on right now in this passage that Jesus is teaching. Because what is happening is that what's under attack is man's love for God and man's love for his fellow man. You, you really can see that in our society right now. And so it's important to go back and look at this passage for a little bit. So again, verse 43. And we're just going to try to preach right out of this context, okay? I'm not going to try to take you too many places today. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So what Jesus is saying is that this is what the world is saying. And then he says this first, he says this to us. But I say to you, but I say to you, whenever you see the fact that Jesus says, but I want to say something to you, there is a moment to stop and to pause and to consider what you first believed. Because he says, but I say to you. So he's about ready to say something, and every time that Jesus speaks, do you know this? He almost always, 99.9%, .9 speaks opposite of what the world says. You know what I mean? And the only reason I gave the world a, like a tenth of a percent is because sometimes they're still kind of saying the things that he used to say. But on the whole, Jesus is almost always speaking opposite of the world. And you see this thing in this very moment. So, but I say to you, again, he's, what he's doing is he's correcting in this moment. He's trying to be able to say, this is what you've always heard, but I say to you. So he, he puts a pause or a comma in the middle of the whole thing, and he begins to say this to us. Love your enemies and bless those who curse you. 
Love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Again, so he's saying, I'm about ready to tell you something that is so opposite to what you've been taught and about what the world is teaching and what you've seen because, again, they're not living according to my kingdom. I'm about ready to tell you something that I'm asking you to do. Isn't it interesting that this is about us? This isn't Jesus saying, hey, you know what? But I tell you that I love. He does love. That's John 3.16. But in this passage, he's saying, look, but you need to love. You, you need to be my, my representatives in love to this world. And, and, and again, what he's saying is that love, I said my title is when love is hard. Um, love is easy when I'm called to love Deb and Julie. I like Deb and Julie. These are great people. I really enjoy hanging around them. They're easy to love. We have a lot in common. We have the same faith. They have nice personalities. They seem to be very kind people. And so it's easy to love and be friends with them or Arnie or Bill or Pat or Gary. It's easy to do that because we're just, it's just simple. But the harder part of love is on the other side of the coin where people that absolutely hate me from the get-go, people that have judged me for who I am, people that don't like me out of the box because of the way I look, maybe it's because of the genealogy that I was born with, the way that I talk, because I have blue eyes, because I have brown hair, because I'm a little chubby. They just don't like me because they've judged me and they put me in this column. And yet Jesus says, I want you to love them just like you love your neighbor that's easy to love. The hard part of love. And it's beautiful because, again, what he says, he doesn't say, he doesn't say just love those that are kind of not like you. Um, he goes to the biggest extreme and he says, love your enemy. The worst person that you don't want to be around, the person that you don't like to see. And what's interesting, have you ever had an enemy? I had one when I was in high school a few times. We all have those things. The very thing that happens to me is that I'm on guard when my enemy's around. And I'm on guard and I'm watching what they're doing. And I'm trying to, to make sure that they don't get me or they don't do anything bad to me. So I'm trying to be protective. It's interesting because, see, the opposite of love is fear. And if I'm afraid of my enemy and afraid of what they can do to me, it is hard to freely love them with the love of Jesus Christ. Perfect love casts out all fear. He's talking about a deep, powerful love in this moment. Where the fact that there's no residual revenge towards my enemy. Is that something we deal with with enemies? I want revenge. I will never trust you. I, I'm on guard around you. So therefore, we, 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 we don't even relate anymore. This is some radical kind of love. It's some hard kind of love. Because again, what we want to have as a result is this. If I love my enemies the way that Jesus Christ loved me, one day we'll be frenemies. It's a new term that's going around, frenemies, when you have an enemy, it's a friend, frenemy. Sorry, other generation, I got lost on that one, I apologize. But what if that doesn't happen? What if that, what if the goal of loving your enemy has nothing to do with them turning or changing? What if God is just calling you to love them sacrificially, and they never love you back, they never like you back, they never treat you better, but what if he says, keep loving them? Because, ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what he's saying. Loving them with expecting the fact that they may never change, but love them, love them. Now, what is so beautiful about the teachings of Jesus Christ is that, and I love this because I find myself in these places where the word of God never lets you off the hook. You know, it's so interesting because we would about ready to do what the Pharisees would do, possibly, if Jesus didn't continue his teaching on. Because, again, he said, again, love your enemies, how many of you know that we can define love in our own terms? I can define love on what's comfortable for me, and so therefore I can make this whole hard love passage comfortable by redefining how I'm going to love somebody. We all know that love has different meanings to different people. Um, you know, when, when people get married, I always ask them, what is the definition of love? And if somewhere in that definition they don't put the word sacrifice, they don't understand love. If somewhere in that definition they don't have the concept of putting the other person first, then they don't understand love. If they don't have in that concept of love daily choosing to have acts of service and kindness to that individual, then they don't really understand love. And, and so Jesus wants to make sure that we as his children understand what kind of love he's talking about. So again, he's talking about love. He's given us the target of our love. And how many of you know this? If you can begin to love your enemies the way that Christ loves, you, he loves all of us, the way that Christ wants us to love our enemies, don't you realize that those that are easy to love, we're going to love better? 
Okay, that's a broad, nobody said anything to that conversation. Um, I, I'm just saying this is what is so key, that the more that I learn to freely love those that are my enemies that are going to treat me bad, the better I'm going to be able to love those that are easy to love. I'm going to be able to love them a little bit more pure. Why? Because, see, to love my enemy means that I have to have less of me and more of God's love to love them. See, it's not about me learning to love better. It's about me learning to love his way through his grace. If you think that you're loving on your own abilities, then I want to be able to challenge you in this moment. No, I have to bend the knee to his will and learn to allow God to love them through me by dominating my actions. By dominating my actions. Because what's really cool about this love thing, and again, I've said to you before that love is always what? It's always a verb. It's always an action. If it's just love without action, it's lip service. Right? I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. It means nothing. But it, when it becomes actions, it becomes real love. It becomes love defined, love walked out, love demonstrated. I don't want love that's not demonstrated. I don't want love that's not defined by my actions. And so Jesus goes a step further here in this moment, and he says, again, love your enemies, the hardest person to love. Love them. God wants you to love them. Do me a favor. Think of the person that you don't like the most right now. For some of you, it won't take you long. Seriously. Think of the person that has been an enemy for a long time you have all this unresolved issues with. Think of the person that you trust the least. Think of the person that's hurt you the most. Think of that very person right there in your life. Don't tell me who it is. But Jesus says, you got to love that person. When he has a conversation with you about that unnamed person that I don't know, do you know part of what he's saying to you? As you're asking that God would help you to get over the hurt, get over the pain, Lord God, make them repent, make them do right by me, do you know part of what his response to you is? Love them. Love them. Love them. Love them. Yeah, but Lord, I'll love them when, it, when, they, when they make it all right with me. And Jesus says back to us upon the cross, have you always done right with me? Yet I still love you. See, that's godly, Christ love. Not based on performance, but based upon a decision to love with the heart of the Father. And so he's not asking us to love them just when they repent or just when they come back to me and say, I'm so sorry. And ladies and gentlemen, this is what is so key about this passage of Scripture. I have met so many families at the graveside and heard conversations about the fact that the person that passed away had enemies they never loved. And there are times in our life when our enemy has passed away. And yet, in this very moment, I want to challenge you that sometimes if you haven't forgiven those that have passed away, that have hurt you, I want to challenge you today to make a fresh start and begin to forgive them and ask God that he would make a loving heart in you for them. See, we have to stop loving people for the way they perform and just love them because they're God's creation. That's a hard word right now, but that's the challenge in the world. The world is judging love based upon skin color and all kinds of crazy stuff. But God says, love them because they're made in my image. God made us in his image. We have to love each other. That's the whole gospel in this moment, whether they be my friend or my enemy. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to be able to say this to you. You want revival. I want revival. I want revival with all of my heart. I want to see the church filled. I want to see sinners saved. I want to see people healed. I want to see the Lord come back for a pure, spotless bride. But what I want to tell you in this moment, what I believe God is after in the middle of this pandemic, is a church that loves like he loves. And that's why it's being so challenged right now. It is insane what I'm hearing. I, was, I wasn't going to share this story, and the weirdest things seemed to happen to me. I was visiting with a friend of mine on Friday afternoon, Friday morning, forgive me, he has a ministry called His Vision Enterprises, and we work together and do some things to help him with his ministry. And I, I, I had to get gas afterwards before I went home, and I got gas, and I was pumping it, and all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I saw this big semi, and this yelling was going on to my left. And I, I looked up, and I looked over, and here's this semi, and he's backing up because he's stuck in this parking lot. He can't get out. And there's a car behind him. I don't know if he saw him or didn't see the car. I have no idea what happened prior to this situation. 
But as I look over, all of a sudden, I hear this guy get out of his car. He slams the door. He's a young man, and he's yelling, and he's swearing, and he runs up to the side of the guy's cab, on the passenger side of the cab, and jumps and opens the door and leaps into the cab. And I'm watching this, and I'm like, oh, Lord, Jesus. And I kept saying to myself, God, don't let him do anything stupid, Lord. And just to begin to pray. And, and so what was so interesting was this. There was, I, I don't know, five people getting gas around. There's other people in the parking lot closer to the truck. You know what they all did? They all got their cell phones out and started recording the event. And I thought to myself, Lord Jesus, this anger has become a, it has become, it has become reality TV. It has become a, a fascination. And, it, and they're just watching this young man get out of this, get, in, get into this guy's cab. And I don't know what was happening, but I begin to pray. I begin to pray for the Spirit of God to hit these people because of the fact that somebody was about ready to do something really, really stupid. And so I don't know exactly what happened, but the young man gets out of the cab, and then I finished up pouring gas, and I was praying for it. I decided to go by and see if I could maybe possibly do anything. And as I'm looking over by the truck, the Lord God says, don't go over there, don't go over there. And so now there's two men outside the driver's side door at this man, yelling at him, pointing their finger. One's going after his leg and swiping his leg. And I see the man get on his phone, and I figured he was probably calling the cops. And all of a sudden, these men seem to get more enraged with what was happening. And I begin to, and I stop my car, and I begin to pray, Lord God, bring this thing to an end, because Satan is using this twisted anger to be able to destroy your image. They don't love this man, they don't care about this man, and vice versa, Lord God. Begin to calm this situation. And all of a sudden, as I'm sitting there praying for a little bit, the Lord said, I don't want you to go over there. I don't, and I, you know what? I wanted to go over there with all of my heart. And, and as I as it finally started to calm down and, and, and I, the police came and, and things started to get to a different situation, I, was, I felt led to drive away. I felt led to drive away and I drove away and I went home and I was praying for the situation and I felt the Lord begin to challenge me. <laughs> ben, do you only love the one that was in the right or do you love the ones that were in the wrong as well? And I thought to myself, Wow, I, I don't know. And the Lord is saying, I want you to love the ones that were in the wrong as well as the ones that were in the right. I'm not saying come into agreement with the actions of the wrong, but I want you to love them like I love them. And my heart was just chastened by the Lord in that moment because I realized what had happened in my own flesh. This has become about a right and wrong thing and no longer about a love thing as Jesus presents us to us here in Matthew. It's always been about love. Those, those kids were that man's enemy in that very moment. And what was happening, because they were doing wrong things, they started to become my enemy. Why? Because I stand for the word of God, and what they were doing was wrong. But what was interesting is I started to lose the love, lose the love calibration. I was just starting to love by the letter of the law. And if they're like me, I'll love them. But that's not how God says. I am to love the unlovable. I am to love the enemies of this world. And that's hard. That's hard. But I'm telling you, that's part of what Satan is after in the smoke and mirrors conversations we're having right now. I'm telling you, man, he's after. He's after this. He wants men to hate men. If you don't think we're in the end times, I would encourage you to spend some time in Revelations. We are in the end times. But let me say this to you. Because we are alive today, we are the end time response of the heart of God to this world. And what he's saying to the church is love, is love. Again, he says again, but I say to you, I'll give you a direction that's opposite of the world. Love your enemies. And then he goes farther. Isn't it beautiful? He doesn't just stop with this word love. He gives us the verbs of what love looks like. And this passage would kind of be easy to swallow if I didn't have to take the word love and begin to examine all the things that he tells me that love looks like. Again, the demonstrations of love is the only way to really see love. One more time. The demonstration of love is the only way to really see love. The verbal of love is a great expression to hear it, but to see it acted out is to see it demonstrated. That's how you see love. See, the world... I think we do a pretty good job of telling the world that we love them. I think we do a pretty good job of telling the world that Jesus loves them, but they need to see the demonstration of that love. And how many of you know that the greatest demonstration we can give is when we are pressed by our flesh in the hardest moments? You know what I mean by that? 
when I have to love the thing that I don't want to love the most, that's the greatest demonstration of my obedience to God when I love the thing that's hardest for me to love or the person that's hardest for me to love. I say to you again that God is after something in the church. I believe with all of my heart God is after something in the church and what he's after is well beyond the lip service that we can give him. He's after the demonstrations of love. Let me read this. If I, if I, unless I'm losing, I don't, want to, I don't want to lose you here today. So, Again, he says, but I say to you, love your enemies. And then he goes and he does it, and he defines what that means. He says this, bless those who curse you. Mm. I don't know about that one. I mean, think about that one, God. This was written how long ago? No, we can't. We can't do that. Can't do that. Bless those who curse you, Ben. In 2020, of today, what is today's date? July 19th, July 6th, 12th. Thank you so much. July 12th, Ben, today, July 12th, 2020, I want you to bless anybody that you come along that curses you. I want you to bless them. Wait a minute. (laughs) Hold on a second, God. Wait, what? Anybody that curses you, anybody that says a bad word about you, anybody that says a bad word to you, anybody that cusses you out, whatever the terminology is, I want you to bless them. Ooh. Wow. Now, what, what he's saying in this is, I want you to speak good of them. That's what the word blessing means. I want you to sense, speak good of them. I, I, if, they, if they say something mean to you, say something nice back to them. If they say you hate, they hate you, say the opposite of that and say, I love you back to them. It is the concept of killing them with kindness, yes. But what is so beautiful about the concept is that I don't get a pat on the back, but that God gets the glory. You're such a good Christian, Ben Geyser. Nice job, buddy. No way. No way. I'm not doing this. Only God can do. Do you know how much my flesh is struggling to love this man? But I'm going to choose to love him. See, love, love. (laughs) Mm. We have, mm. why in the world? Boy, my heart is hard about this one. You know, I, I love romance. I appreciate romance. I don't know that I'm the most romantic person, but I'm a fairly considerate husband with my wife. But I love romance. Um, but but I, I want to be able to say that I think sometimes, that because romance has this emotion and feeling to it. That's part of what goes first in romance. Is I just feel romantic tonight, whatever it is. Let's leave that alone. Okay, let's not, that, that was going, we're not going farther with that. But my point is this, is that in this gospel of Jesus Christ, there's, there's, not, a, there's not a based upon emotion. There's this... There's just simply this decision to do what is right in the eyes of God to be able to demonstrate love. And so the conversation that says, Lord, I don't feel like it today is no excuse that we should not be loving those around us that we don't like. That's the, that's the key thing in this. You know what, Lord God, I, I, I will, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing this, but I really don't think I love them until I start feeling love towards them. I, I want to be able to say to you that The moment you choose to love the way that God loves them, you're acting out in love. And so you're already defining love. Don't worry about letting the emotion catch up with it. Just keep walking in obedience. Does that make sense? Because many times what we hear is, well, I don't feel like it. And even though I did the right thing, I really don't think I love them because I didn't really feel any better afterwards. God's not asking you to feel better. He's asking you just simply to do right. Does that make sense? Emotions are a blessing, but they cannot be the driving train. Motions cannot be the plumb line of our faith. Faith has always been an action. It's always been a verb. And so it's always about doing what's right, no matter how my flesh may feel about that. Amen? If you've been married more than 10 years, you love your spouse, but not every day do you feel like it, right? Not every day do you feel romantic. And lo- well, I think Arnie probably does. Arnie strikes me as a very romantic man. But I'm not like Arnie. So not every day do I feel romantic with my wife, but I love her every day. If you stop and ask that, well, absolutely I love my wife every day. And there are days when I'm on Arnie's level, and there's days when I'm on, God help me, Dean's level. And so there we go. And so I'm just saying, okay, we'll move on. So I love you, Dean. I love you, Dean. (laughs) So again, he defines and he says, love your enemy. (laughs) Dean, that just came out so naturally. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't help that. Okay, that's not even in my notes. That just happened. Okay. Lord, thank you for laughter in the middle of the word. Amen. Yeah, see, that's just a... Laughter doeth good like a medicine. We, we need, mm, there are times when we're, when, we're, when we're drinking something out of the word of God that always doesn't taste good. You know, there are, there are times when the word of God tastes bitter to my flesh. My flesh doesn't like it, but I got to drink it because it's what he says. 
And I love how God puts laughter when we drink something bitter. He's just so good like that. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, love your, I say love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. So again, the first demonstration of love is blessing those that curse you. That's the first thing that God asks us to be able to do. That first action of love is to bless those that curse you. Now, this is what's interesting about this is this. Um, I, and I'll move on. I don't want to get too far here. Um, it's easy to bless people that curse you in public because you're trying to be an example in the public. You know what I mean? Somebody to walk into this church and say, oh, Pastor Ben, I think you're a horrible teacher. I don't like this church. I don't like you. I don't like the whole Christianity thing. I think you're horrible. You know, just go away. No, 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 no. Okay, they come in and I'd be like, I love you. I'm sorry you feel that way. God bless you. We love you so much. How can we minister to you in this moment? And they continue to speak profanity to me and they walk right out. And it's easier for me to do the right thing in this moment because I'm trying to be a demonstration of God's love. I'm trying to act and be a demonstration of God's love. But this word bless also means to do it behind closed doors. Also means to do it when there's nobody else watching. That I'm, I'm speaking well of them to the Lord in prayer. I'm speaking blessings on their life to the Lord in prayer in these moments. God, God, just have your way with this person. God, turn this person around. I believe there's good in them. Father, I love them based upon your love. Just speaking blessings to them. So it's not what is just done in public. It's what's done in private that really defines obedience. Because, don't be offended by this, Doing it in public is acting. Doing it in private is living it. Does that make sense? God does not, the word acting, hypocrite. We, God's not about hypocrites. He's about the fact that we do it behind the closed door. We do it in our prayer closet. That's, that's real love he's talking about here. All right. Are we okay? There are times when I just feel like this is okay. All right, all right, we're good. I will not preach based upon feeling. I will preach based upon the word of God. Let's move forward. Bless those who curse you. Now he goes a little bit farther and he says this. Because I can, okay, Lord, I, can, I got this down. I can speak good things about those who curse me. Then he says this. Do good to those who hate you. How many of you know that people that hate you usually take from you? And he says, do good to those who hate you. Oh, come on. Do good to those that hate me. Lord, I, I want to put up my fence a little bit taller. I, I, want to, I want to make my home a little bit more protective. I don't want to do good to those that hate me. I just want to, I'll tolerate them good enough, but I don't want to have to do actually good to them. Because see, this whole conversation, do good to those who hate you. There, there, is, there is a need to be able not just to speak now, but there's this need to be able to take my hands and feet and be able to take everything I got and go to that person and take my resources and go and say, hey, I know that you hate me, but I feel led to give you 150 bucks today, and it's just from the Lord. I want to tell you that. It's just one example. To take my resources and to do good to you, even though you hate me. I know you hate me, and, you've, and we're having this rough relationship, but I want to tell you, God loves you, and, and, and a demonstration of that love is that I want to take something that I have, and I want to do good with it, and I want to give it to you. Well, that sounds a lot like the cross. I want to give you something that I have that's valuable to me to demonstrate to you how much I love you. Wasn't that Jesus and the cross? I want to give something precious to you to demonstrate to you how much I love you. So again, this, this loving them as God loves them, that's what he's talking about, giving something that is important to me and give to you to be able to, to bless you. Do good to those who hate you. What's interesting is that um, many times we will, we will seek to do good to those that we feel deserve it. I, I, the way I go to church sometimes up here, and even when I go to church in Columbus, there's, there's certain corners where there are people standing there begging. And every once in a while I feel led to give. Sometimes I don't feel led to give. But it's interesting because in this passage of Scripture, a lot of times I'll leave in the morning, on a Tuesday morning or on a Sunday morning, early in the morning. I'm like, okay, Lord, is there somebody you want me to give to? And I'll think about that concept, possibly. But it's interesting because part of what should be on my radar now is to think about those that, 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 that again, that hate me. So, Lord God, who in my life hates me? And the question isn't this, God, do you want me to do good to them? That's not the question. The question is, Lord God, what kind of good do you want me to do, and when do you want me to do it? See the whole paradigm shift here? Because part of whom I need to love and how the part of who I need to bless 
isn't just the ones around me that I love so much and want to help out. It's the loves that those that hate me. <laughs> that should be on the top of my list based upon this passage of Scripture. So God, how can I do good? And for those of you that are married, it's you and your spouse doing that kind of good together. So doing good, not just to those that are easy to bless, but those that hate me, don't like me, do good. That's God's kind of love. That's radical kind of love. All right, let's finish this out. <laughs> and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. Ooh, okay. Pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. <laughs> um, God, again, God is, when he says this, um, he, he's built upon this whole thing of love because we can, we can think about, I can pray. Oh, I got some prayers for those who spitefully use me. I know how to pray for those people. And we can begin to have these prayers of vengeance and that God would rain down his wrath and all those kind of things. But you can never disconnect this verse from the first thing he said, which was love. You know, we, we, so again, he's already set us up because we, okay, I got this whole prayer thing down, Lord. No problem there. I'm going to go to Revelations or I'm going to go back to the Old Testament and I'm going to, I'm going to see how you dealt with the children of Israel when they weren't obedient. I got that kind of prayer going on, God. But he says, no, love, love, love. The model for that prayer is John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So, Father, I begin to pray in accordance with your heart. See, that is the whole difference between religion and true faith. True faith captures the heart of the Savior. Religion wants to use the laws against people. But the heart of the Savior is to love. The heart of the Savior is to love. And so again, I, I have to love them in such a way that it's a sacrificial kind of love. And so that I would begin to pray for them and pray for them in love. Pray for them in goodness. And, and the mercies of God would be, would be hard upon their life. And I've said this to you a couple weeks ago. As we're looking at again at, at uh, Moses and David, they both prayed for God's mercy even though the people deserved God's wrath. It doesn't take me but five minutes to watch the news and look at somebody that I could choose. Huh, well, God's wrath should be on that person. <laughs> Lord, forgive us for that. But as I read the scripture and how I'm supposed to model the image of God and the heart of God and the character of God, I am to look upon them in love, not hate. I'm praying for God's mercy that his wrath would tear, they would have a moment to repent and come into the kingdom of salvation through the name of Jesus Christ. That is what I'm called to be able to do. But let me finish up this passage because it's so important what he says here. Verse 45, he tells us to do all of these things and Spitefully use and persecute you. Um, I, I, I want you to just take a moment with that word persecute, by the way. You think, <laughs> if I would have said that word persecute a couple years ago, okay, that word persecute is becoming more and more and more real to the church right now. Do we understand that? That's becoming more real to the church. And I want to tell you something. That word is going to get more and more real as we move on. Persecute is going to become more and more real because the world already doesn't like what we stand for. Amen? So, again, when we get persecuted, what Satan hopes is that we start hating those that persecute us. He's, he's, he's hoping that we're going to hate the world because they're persecuting us. We're going to, and, and that is the opposite of the heart of God. Pray for those that persecute you. Very key. All right, verse 45. Do all of these things. Do all of these things. Act love out in, these, in those ways. Um, verse 45. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he, uh-oh, uh-oh, do you know what God's about ready to do here? He's about ready to show you an example of how he treats those that do not love him, that hate him and persecute him. He says, for he makes... The, his son, his son, rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So what God is saying to you is this. I'm not asking you to do something that I'm not already doing. Why in the world does the sun rise on the believer and the non-believer? Why, why do the non-believers prosper for a season? Why does he send rain on the crops of the farmer that hates him as well as the one that loves him? Because, 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 because. God doesn't just love those that are his. He loves all creation. And it's a demonstration of his grace and of his mercy and of his kindness. 
Do you ever think about that? I think about that all the time. The guy next to me that's spouting all kind of satanic stuff. Brother, do you know that because you have breath in your life, God is showing mercy on you in this moment? God could take your breath away in a second. But the question is this. Will you not respond to this mercy while you still can? Because again, there's coming a day when there will be no more chance to respond. I want to say to us that the ability to bend the knee happens <laughs> while we're alive on this earth. When we pass over, the response timetable is gone. And that's true gospel. I do not believe in any way, shape, or form that after you've died, after your will has surrendered itself to the ground, can you make a decision to follow Christ afterwards? It has always been and always will be a bending of the will, asking God to come into your life to forgive you of your sins. To ask him after you've died is not the gospel. Do we understand that? And if you struggle with that, I encourage you to talk to me or get into your word because that's a whole other kind of false doctrine that's being taught right now. It's accounted once for man to die. It is the time for repentance is now. We don't get to die and all of a sudden, oh, whoa, you are God. Hey, can you forgive me now, please? Would you do that for me? That's not an act of will. That's an act of revelation. Do you understand that? That's, that's not an act of will. That's an act of revelation here. So we have to be so clear that it is this life that God has given us that we have the opportunity to choose him, to love him, and to have, make him our savior. So I don't want to get too far down that road, but that's an important thing to understand. Okay, for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same thing? And if you greet your brethren only, what more do you do than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Last verse here. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. That word perfect, it's a hard word to swallow sometimes. And what he's saying is that you will model, just like your Father in heaven models. You will, you will do and live according to the way that he does and lives. And so if God chooses to give sun and rain, if God chooses to give blessings, good and bad, I mean, blessings to those around you, that do not know him, that do not love him? Are we, not, are we to do anything less than what God has done? We're not. We are to do what he has asked us to be able to do. Let me finish with this. So we live in different worlds. Uh, for myself, I find myself in a season where I'm about, out and about a lot these days, it seems like. And I'm running into all kinds of people these days in the stores and um, all over the place um, that need a demonstration of this passage of scripture for my life. They need me to demonstrate love to them. They really do. And, I, and, and I'm, Lord, help me to do it. By his strength, by the way, all of us have to do this. But some of us may not be out and about as much. And you may think to yourself, well, Pastor Ben, what do you want me to be able to do in this moment? I want you to know that there is power in prayer. I want you to know there's power at the bedside where you're, kneeing, where you're bending down and praying for the Spirit of God to come upon this world. Praying that the love of God will be released through this world. I, I find it concerning when people continue to say, I want revival, but they don't have love on their tongues. I want revival. I want God's revival. I, I want a word revival, absolutely. But what I want is a love God revival. Because if I have a love God revival, then the church will have a love man revival. And that's really revival.